As we come to Daniel chapter 2, allow me to read the first four verses. It says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and a sleep break from him. And the king commanded all the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dream. For they came and stood, so they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Shall we pray? God, our Father, we ask your help as we come to this passage of Scripture to give us some understanding and interpretation of literally what it says and spiritually and doctrinally what it means to our life. And Father, we pray that we'll be better off because of the time we spent this morning studying your word in your Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, we ask it. Amen. We ended last week just reading the first three verses of Daniel chapter 2 in order to just make a, a, a point at the end concerning Nebuchadnezzar, who has more power than any king has ever had up to his time. He's now got control of the whole world. It's in, in his control. And here he is, the richest, most famous, most powerful man in the world, goes to bed at night and can't sleep. And we took some warning from the Bible how Solomon, who was also rich, saw real uh, vanity in the fact that, that riches steal sleep from people, that their riches end up taking them over and they can't sleep. I hope you learned the lesson and none of you went out and bought a lottery ticket yesterday. Both they kept announcing on the news, biggest one or sixth biggest one or something, and everybody going to go out and win the lotto and, and uh, become rich. And uh, hopefully we learned a lesson about that and uh, do not seek and covet riches like the world does. Either way, today we're going to go on with that and talk about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and in and, and this whole chapter, the whole chapter 2 of Daniel is concerned with that dream. That's what everything is about. Naturally, what was the dream? He's questioning what the dream was. What was the dream, and what, was the, what is the interpretation of the dream? Immediately, he has a dream, and our attention is drawn to that, and that's the most obvious part of the chapter, is to finally find out what the dream was and what the interpretation was. But I want you to know that there's 40, was it 49 verses in this chapter? Yeah, 49 verses. And it's only the last 20 verses that deal with what is the dream and what's the interpretation. The first part of this chapter deals with something far more important than that. It has to do who gave the dream and who can give the interpretation. Now, if you don't get the first part of the chapter, the last part of the chapter is, it has no, no value at all. And the first and most important part of this dream that, that Nebuchadnezzar has and what we're going to study about that dream is who gave the dream and who it is that can give the interpretation of the dream. Then we'll find out the dream and what the interpretation is. And so that's what's going on here. And Nebuchadnezzar calls his advisors forward and, and asks them the dream. Notice in verse 4. We learn a, a lesson, I think, in verse 4. It says, then, then spake the Chaldean, Chaldeans uh, to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. It's interesting that the Bible points out the fact that he said it to them in Syriac. Uh, notice who's talking to, the Chaldeans. Uh, that's a special group that we'll talk about in just a little bit. But they said to the king, and then the Bible tells us what language they're speaking in. Well, that lets us know that there is something that they're not speaking the Hebrew language that most of your Old Testament is written in. In fact, the people who study realize that there is something interesting in the book of Daniel. And that is from chapter 1, verse 1, until chapter 2 and verse 3 is written in Hebrew. But when you come to chapter 2, verse 4, and all the way through to the end of chapter 7, I believe it ends in verse 28, it's written in... Syriac, or in uh, uh, Aramaic, Aramaic language. Uh, and the Chal Chaldeans spoke that. And then from chapter 8 on, it goes back to being written in Hebrew. Which is real interesting why the Bible would do that. Uh, we're only given a hint by the fact that we're told what language they're speaking to the king. But 
the pen down in that very same language, which, which is interesting, like I say. Apparently, it becomes interesting to the fact that Daniel has in this book, it, as you go through it, notice Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Later on, you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar have another dream, go through an experience, have a vision. His son or grandson is also going to have a vision. God has given visions and dreams to some Gentiles. And when those dreams are talked about and interpreted, it's interpreted in Aramaic, which is the international language of the world in those days. As if God had a message to Gentile people concerning what was going on. Now, we know from, Gen uh, from Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1 that, that Nebuchadnezzar came and took over Jerusalem, the city of God. And, and totally took over the nation of Israel, all the nations, but the nation of Israel, God's people. And that when he did that, he took, he went into the temple of Israel and took the gold and the silver that was in their temple and brought it into the temple of his God, as if to demonstrate the God of Babylon has conquered the other gods of the world, or the gods of Babylon, there were several. And we know right away that it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into, the hand, uh, into his hands. He didn't conquer God. God gave. In fact, the Bible says God raised up Nebuchadnezzar and God used Nebuchadnezzar to do, to do for Israel something to teach them a lesson concerning their idolatry. And we know that by reading Scripture. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that. And it's interesting that as these Gentiles have dreams and visions that there's a communication given in the international language of the world so that all the world could realize who's behind all this. And it's not the gods of Babylon. It's the God of Israel. That he's the one, and the God of Israel has a message to the Gentile world. Then when you pick up even the end of chapter 7, uh, Daniel has a dream. And then from that point on, the dreams regard Daniel. He begins to have the dreams and the interpretation as well as the dream. And then it goes back from chapter 8 on to be written in the Hebrew language as if God is now specifically addressing the nation of Israel again concerning their captivity and how long it will last and why it happened. In other words, when we see the book of Daniel and realize that the couple languages that are there, it's very obvious that God had a specific message to give through Daniel to the Gentiles so that all the world would know what's going on, why the Gentiles are able to conquer Israel. Then he goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel and gives a special message designed for them that has to do with why they're in captivity and what their final end will be. You know what that teaches us? Something that we emphasize over and over again at Grace Bible Church, that all the Bible is written for us, but it's not all written to us. You see that in the book of Daniel. When God wanted to address and make sure the Gentiles knew something, He used their language and communicated a truth because there was a message specifically for them. Then when he went to deal with the nation of Israel, he communicated back in the Hebrew language the message that was specifically to the nation of Israel. It was all for everybody, but it was specifically addressed to different groups. And you know, that's true today. The book of Genesis to Revelation is for us to study. We go to all part of it and study it all. But you know, the only part of this Bible that's addressed to us, specifically as Gentiles in the dispensation of God's grace, the age in which we're living today, where Israel has been set aside not just politically, but spiritually. He's not, they're not his people today. He set them aside and called out the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, alike in Jesus Christ. And the books of the Bible that are addressed specifically to us are the books of Romans to Philemon. Paul writes to Gentiles. That's the first book of the Bible that's ever addressed to a Gentile. And so there we have, we have it by application back here, and it's true. And you know, it's funny, the scholars, I, I would look at this, and I would almost hesitate to share that with you, because to the naked eye, we can't substantiate the fact that that's true. That Daniel actually, from chapter 2 in verse 4 until chapter 7, verse 28, wrote in Aramaic language. And then the other parts he wrote in the Hebrew language. All we got is it in the English language. We can't really prove that. And so that's not really, I'm, I don't care if you believe that or not, that's not really that important. But it's interesting how important that is to the scholars. Every book that I have on Daniel brings that point out. I think uh, Schofield brings it out. Everybody brings that point out. Oh, how interesting. Look at the two languages because of this reason. And then when you say, well, why don't you take that to what's obvious in Scripture, 
that all the Bible, all the Old Testament is addressed to the nation of Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts has to do with what God was doing with the nation of Israel, and Acts shows historically the cutting off of the nation of Israel. Why? Well, you come to Romans to Philemon. All of a sudden, God's addressing Gentiles and gives us new instructions about a new age and a new people called out. And when this age is over in the rapture, all of a sudden in your Bible, after the Romans to Philemon ends, you've got Hebrews through Revelation. God goes back and deals with Israel. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, to Daniel chapter 2, verse 3, Hebrew. Listen, Israel, look at Daniel. He's your testimony of someone who's going to stand for God against the heathenism of the world. Then in chapter uh, 2, verse 4, until chapter 7, verse 28, listen, Gentiles, you didn't conquer Israel. Everything is in the God of Israel's hands, the true and living God, not in your idols. And so the message goes to the Gentiles. And then from Daniel chapter 8, on, here Israel, here's your final outcome. Here's why you're in in captivity. Here's what's going to take you all the way to the end. Here's what's going to happen for you. That follows the whole pattern of the Bible, don't it? God writes to Israel, interrupts the program, addresses Gentiles. Hebrews from Revelation goes back and deals with the nation of Israel again. Interesting that scholars will see it in Daniel, but don't see it in the overall writing of the Bible. But that's important to see, and it's important for you to take note of. Now, Daniel uh, Daniel records, or we're reading here about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He has this dream. You realize that Neb's kind of, and by the way, I, Nebuchadnezzar, whenever I read my notes, they say Neb. I don't write that name out and uh, sometime work on learning how to spell Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Anyhow, look, read with me or follow along as I read verses 5 through 9. He's wise. It says, The king answered and said unto the Chaldean, Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye will gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream and I will know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. Nebuchadnezzar is about to test his phony advisors. Phony is very obvious. This thing, there's no playing around with Nebuchadnezzar. This thing is a real important matter with him. This dream has got him troubled. He can let them buffalo him at other times and let him come and say the things he wants them to say and and get by with that, but he wants to know the true interpretation. He's not about to sit around and listen to some phony yak away. And, you know, you can ask anybody. You could say, I had a dream and tell a dream. Couldn't you make up an interpretation to a dream? (laughs) <laughs> that'd be easy. You just sit there and daydream a little bit and say, well, here's what this means. And you can make it up. How If the person's asking you, apparently they don't know what it means, so they don't know if you're right or wrong. So Nebuchadnezzar's about to test these men. They're, they're special men, special advisors. They're the, the cream of the occultic crop. And they're, they're going to come to him and they're going to give him uh, the answer. But he says, now, I want to know for sure that what my dream means, so therefore you tell me the dream. You know, as I read this, sometimes I read chapter 2, and I think that Nebuchadnezzar is telling the truth, that he can't really remember the dream. Haven't you ever had that? Haven't you had a dream? You go, wow, man, i got to think about this when I wake up in the morning. And you wake up in the morning. <laughs> Haven't you done that? And then you wake up in the morning and you go to tell someone a dream. You can't even remember a detail. It's just totally gone. So I, I look at that, read the passage, and think, well, he's telling the truth. Then I begin to realize his wisdom, and I think, well, maybe he's lying. If so, the Bible records a lie, doesn't it? But whose lie is it? It's Nebuchadnezzar's lie. Of course a Gentile king is a liar. And and we record his lie. There's no problem there. But I don't really know which way. I don't know if he's using wisdom or really lost the dream. It doesn't really matter. It's going to serve God's purpose. Anyhow, you go back and forth depending on which time I read it. But anyhow, the king, he's about to test his phony advisors. Now look at his advisors. Go to verse 2 again. It says, The king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, to show unto the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. 
And it's always the Chaldeans that speak. You always see that. The whole group of them that are called. These are his advisors. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, when he wants to know divine will, he has a means to try to figure it out. Just like all kinds of superstitious things go on today. But this is a science back here. These were not just, they were superstitious and they were cultic. But they were also a standard means of trying to find out. A Gentile who didn't know the true God would call these different kind of mystical people in to tell them the interpretation of the dream. And so he calls these group of men, Nebuchadnezzar does this. I want you to get used to a passage of scripture that will become important later. Come with me to the book of Ezekiel, the book before Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 21. And here we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar using, I don't want to just say superstitious, but occultic means to find out divine will. And you get to see it in a real descriptive way. And then this passage is going to become important to Daniel chapter 2, as we'll bring out perhaps another week, next week or so. Uh, but Ezekiel chapter 21. Now, Ezekiel is a contemporary of Daniel. Daniel was taken in the first captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in unto Judah. He took and sieged the city and took away some people. Daniel was the first taken. Seven years later, they rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar's authority. Nebuchadnezzar came back and took the city again. The second time, uh, Ezekiel is taken away into captivity. And then the third time, he comes and destroys the city, and the people that are left there are really in bad shape. Uh, but Ezekiel is taken seven years after Daniel. He's taken into captivity, and he begins to have visions and revelations. And here's the thing that God says to Ezekiel in chapter 21, verse 18. It says, The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Also thou, son of, uh, son of man, appoint thee two ways that the sword, the king, the sword of the king of Babylon may come, both twain shall come forth out of one land. And choose the play, uh, and, and, and choose thou a place, choose it at the head of two, of, of the way to the city. Anoint a way that the sword may come to Rabbath of the Am Ammonites and to Judah in Jerusalem the defense. Now, what it is, is God tells the prophet, one, there's going to be judgment coming from one place, it's going to go to two places. It's going to judge the Ammonites, and it's going to judge Judah. As Nebuchadnezzar marches along, he's going to come to a fork in the road, and he's got to decide which one he's going to go and destroy first. Now, when he makes that decision, God turns to Ezekiel and he says, choose. Make a choice. Which is he going to choose? Because God's going to manipulate what's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, as the prophet is told to choose, watch how Nebuchadnezzar choice, how he makes his choice. He comes to that parting of the way. Verse 21. It says, for the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination, to make his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. Now, Nebuchadnezzar comes here, and now he's got to make a choice in battle where he's going to go and who he's going to fight. And he comes to the parting of the ways, and when he makes his choice, he uses divination, divining. He's going to use occultic means to find out what's the divine will. Trouble is, he's serving the wrong God, is he not? Just like Hussein today, he's got the wrong God behind him. He's got a devil manipulating him, moving him around. But God controls even the satanic things of this world. Satan cannot do anything outside of God's divine control. So as they're divining, trying to find divine will, here's the means that he uses. He made his arrows bright. Now, from my study, what I understand from that, it's close to what we call picking straws, drawing straws. You know how you put a bunch of straws together, and uh, you know straws from, from a broom or something, and, and you make one shorter than the other, but you make them all nice and even. You pick one. If you get the short one, that, that's the one you choose. Well, what they did is they would take their arrows of war, and they have a quiver, you know, where you keep the arrows in, but they would write on the shaft of one of those arrows, Jerusalem, or they would write uh, Rabbah, what is the name of that other city, <laughs> Rabbah. They'd write those two names and then put them in the quiver and then draw which one's going to come out first. So he's drawing arrows. Uh, he not only did that, it says, he made his arrows bright, he consulted with images. Now he's actually going into trances and things. People are going to consult and, and say, the Spirit said this, the Spirit said that. Uh, he also, he looked in the liver. 
And what they did is Nebuchadnezzar come along and he's at the parting of two ways and he's got to stop. What he did is animal sacrifice to his God. And what they did is they'd offer an animal sacrifice to their God and they'd say something like this. Should I go to Jerusalem and conquer Jerusalem? Then they'd slay the animal and then they'd pull the liver out of the animal and they'd look into that liver. And the idea is if the liver looked healthy, that was favorable. Go do it. If the liver of the animal doesn't look healthy, then don't do it. So there are all kinds of omens, all kinds of ways that they're trying to find out whether which he should go. Now look at verse 22. It says, at his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem. Jerusalem got picked. It says, to anoint captains, to open the mouth in, in the slaughter, to open the voice, uh, to lift up the voice with shooting, to anoint battering rams against the gate, to cast a mount, to build a fort. And it shall it, it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight. That is, the people of Jerusalem, Zedekiah, who and his princes, they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to come fight us. He's not going to come conquer our city. And, and, and they're, they're denying this. It, so it, they're saying it's false. To them that have sworn oaths, they promised allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar, that he will call to remembrance the, the, uh, the iniquity that they may be taken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that all your doings, your sins do appear, because I say that ye are come to remembrance, ye shall be taken with the hand. And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord, remove the diadem. You're about to go. And this is speaking, the wicked prince of Israel, speaking about Israel as a nation, a complete nation. He's speaking about Zedekiah. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to come the third time and conquer Zedekiah and destroy that city. Now, I'm going to stop there in the middle of that verse, and you'll see the application of it later as we study more in Daniel another day. But right here, we've seen how Nebuchadnezzar used uh, occultic means to try to find out the will of God and that he's going to go in and, and conquer this. You know what's interesting to me? I don't know if I'm reading into this, but it's just interesting. It, it says at the end of verse 23, it says, But he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they, that they may be taken. Nebuchadnezzar does all this stuff to try to figure out whether he ought to go and conquer Jerusalem, but really what is going to determine who he's going to go destroy? All of a sudden in his mind is going to pop in the rebellion of Jerusalem. And he's going to say, I'm going to go destroy Jerusalem. And you know, it's almost like what people always do. You might do all kinds of omens to try to figure out which way you ought to go, but in reality you're going to go your own way anyhow. You already have in your mind what you're going to do. And that's I read that and I realize that what God did is he put in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to go conquer Jerusalem. And God and Nebuchadnezzar went and conquered Jerusalem. And, and it didn't matter what all arrows pointed out or what the liver said. He had it jumped in his mind. That's what he was going to do. And that's how people treat all kinds of things, the will of God and all of that. But you know, Israel, all this divination stuff, it comes from devils. It's all occultic. It's all evil. It's something that no Christian should ever be involved in. We have a way to know the will of God. And Israel had a way to know the will of God. And it was not to do the things that the heathen do. Come over with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. God warns. He calls out the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And they're wandering through the wilderness and He's preparing them to be His people, to be different than the other people. And He warns them not to get involved in these things because people have been involved in these things since they went to idolatry. When they turned from the true God, they turned to, to all de devil type of worships. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, look at verse 10. Is that what I want? Let's start in verse 9. It says, Thou shalt, uh, and thou shalt come, Deuteronomy, I'm not in the right chapter. 18, verse 9, there we go. And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. 
or that useth divination, divination, or an observer of things, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all the, all that, all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. You know what a necromancer is? We use it today as someone that, that has a, uh, channeling. Yeah, that's what the modern term is, but I mean, we use it even in a, a mild way. If someone has a, he's a ventriloquist, he makes, he throws his voice, makes it sound like it comes out of somewhere else. It's someone speaking out with another voice. And that's channeling, the things that go on today. All kind of occultic things that are popping up today. It used to be people played with this. Now all of a sudden it's coming in as an acceptable way of finding God's will, of what's going to happen to our world. And, and it's all part of the new age. It's nothing new about it. It goes all the way back here, and God's people are forbidden to have any part of any of this stuff. Why? It says, uh, going on in verse 12, Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be, a, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou possess hearken un, uh, hearkened unto observers of time and unto diviners, but for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do uh, so to do. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Of thy brethren like unto me, him shall ye hearken. Now that's Moses is a prophet raised up from God. Listen to God's prophet. In the Old Testament, God spoke to the nation of Israel through prophets. And that's a prophecy about God raising up Jesus Christ. And along with every one of these prophets and every one of those times came written scripture. God raised up Moses, Moses prophesied, but he also wrote the books of Moses, did he not? You have in the Bible, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. God raised up other prophets to the nation of Israel and they got the rest of the Old Testament. God raised up Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ spoke through his apostles to write the New Testament. And the way we know God's divine will is not going to a spiritualist, not looking into a liver, not doing any kind of omen, not listening to some guy channeling or some woman channeling. You know God's divine will by reading the Scriptures. And that's what God is teaching the nation of Israel. Don't do what the heathen did who went into idolatry and are listening to Satan. You have me. I'll raise up a prophet. I'll speak to you through those prophets. And the prophets recorded in God's Word. Come back with me to chapter 13 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 13, just the first four verses, you get a warning from God here concerning after Moses spoke and wrote some things down, what if someone contradicts it? Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign and a wonder. Man, a miracle man has appeared. And the sign and the wonder come to pass. He actually did it. Where, whereof he, he spake uh, unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Leave the true and living God. Let's go into these other gods. They're all gods. Let's just accept them all. Let's embrace all forms of religion. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. You know, there's a real strong warning there to the nation of Israel. Yeah, so a guy comes along, maybe he does have mystical powers, and he can do some things, but he doesn't speak according to Scripture. He tells you to depart from me and embrace all kinds of other forms of religion. He says, I'm trying you. I'm allowing that man to have that supernatural power to see if you're going to follow my voice the things I've commanded, the things I've said. That's the things in Scripture. And you know, uh, too much is going on today in the hocus-pocus world in Christianity and outside of Christianity. You know God's will by going to His Scriptures and reading the Scriptures and then rightly dividing the Scriptures to know what God has said to you as a Gentile concerning this age we live in. And so we realized what Nebuchadnezzar was doing, Israel was forbidden to do these things, and, and have no part, even if the supernatural things start happening and coming true. You stick with the book. 
You follow God's word and God's divine revealed will. Now, come back with me to the book of Daniel. You know, God, when he put this Bible together, he didn't expect people to take it lightly. He expected his book to be honored, read, reverenced, and followed. And boy, to take God's word lightly and to mix all these other things in with it is a very dangerous thing for your own spiritual condition, perhaps for your salvation if you're not saved. No other way to be saved other than what the Bible says to be saved through Jesus Christ. But you read this, you know, and look at these things. He, he had magicians come to him. That's the first in the list of Daniel chapter 2, verse 2. He commanded the magicians. Doesn't that remind you of Egypt when Moses went up against the Egyptians of Pharaoh, uh, the magicians of Pharaoh in Egypt and how they, they, they duplicated everything Moses did? You know, that what's interesting is I look at this, I see Daniel not just doing what Moses did. Moses went against the magicians. Daniel's going against the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. He's taking on the whole occultic crop at one time. I like that term. <laughs> He's taking them all on at once. Moses took one on. He took on the magician, not just one magician, but he took on the magicians. Daniel's taken all the occultic group, and he's taken them on at one time to show who is the one who gives the dream and can interpretate the dream. These guys couldn't do it. Daniel's going to do it, and you're going to see that. So he goes against the magicians, astrologers. That's the people who try to tell the future by looking into the stars. Things that no Christian is supposed to be involved in. Sorcerers. Uh, forget my notes on that one. Oh, the people who, who consult the spirits by way of use of drugs. Going and enchanting and, and going into trances and even using drugs to get those trances. Sorcerers. And then the Chaldeans. Now that's, that is an interesting. Notice that's the only one capitalized. Do you see that? The Chaldeans are an interesting group of people. You know, we were talking one time on a Friday night and my brother was sharing to me that that term today in Chaldean communities in the United States means so-called Christian, uh, uh, Arabs. I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, it's interesting, it's, it's a special term here. Do you realize every time they speak, it's the Chaldeans that speak? These are a special group of people. These were the, the cream of the crop, so to speak. These are the ones who are, are more in tune in, in intellectual and in study and in the searching out of truth. They did it through all the occultic means, but they were far above. They were superior. They're the superior race. What's interesting, as a people, they are the ancient people of Kuwait. I looked on a map, that's where they're from. Babylon came and conquered them, and sometimes the Bible will call all the Babylonians Chaldeans. But the original Chaldeans are those who were right there where Kuwait is today. And they were the ancient people that had more knowledge than everybody else. Remember in Daniel chapter 1, in verse 4, Daniel was being trained in science and the learning tongue of the Chaldeans? Daniel was being trained to be one of these men, the superior race, the most intellectual, and they used all the, all the sorceries and all the rest of the others, but they were the most uh, intelligent of the group, the wise men. And by the way, the wise men that were called, interesting thing, the, uh, the whole study is interesting. The wise men who were called uh, saw the star from the east. They were in the east and they saw the star well, Babylon's to the east of Jerusalem when Jesus Christ was born. And we talk about them being kings, but they call them magi. And the idea of that is we're talking about the wise men from the east. We're talking about these kind of men, which is interesting. Daniel was being trained to be one of those men, was he not? And I recently heard a tape of how, how in, in Babylon, because Israel was taken captive by Babylon, that many institutions of learning of, of the nation of Israel were established in ancient Babylon. And that the wise men who came from the east were probably Jews who had been studying their scriptures and recognized their Messiah was born. Jews who were these kind of Jews who were trained and, and became maybe not the occultic. I'm not trying to call them cultic. I'm talking about them being the supreme wise people who have studied over in Babylon in the east and then came to Jerusalem. And that would make sense. They were the ones who were told to look for a Messiah. And so therefore, maybe they were Jews who came, the wise men coming from the east. Uh, even one more compounded interest to that. 
is when you read Peter, when Peter writes first, Peter, I think it is, he writes from Babylon. Apparently, there was a great number of settlements of the Jews over in, in the east in Babylon. And as Peter is ministering to the Jews scattered abroad, he went to Babylon where there was a good number of them so that he might minister to them. That's where he writes First Peter from. And so it all does fit together. These are a, a special group of people. These are the ones who speak. Now, we're just flying out of time or running out of time here. Uh, let, let's at least expose these men because that's what uh, Nebuchadnezzar does. Verse 10. And the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth. Boy, how true this is. There is not a man upon the earth that can show unto the king, uh, show the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler that asks such things, uh, of, asks such things of any magician or astrologer a Chaldean. It is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods in who, uh, the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now, you know, the Chaldeans, they said something that's true right there. Nebuchadnezzar said, you tell me the dream and then I'll, then I'll believe your interpretation. And they said, you know, no one has ever asked that. No one can tell you what you dreamed. No one knows what's in your mind. You're asking something that only the gods would know. Of course, they would say gods, wouldn't they? But their statement is true. Only the God would know this. And they're absolutely right. And you know what they're about to prove? They're about to prove that the God of Daniel is indeed the true God. They're about to prove that by their own statement. We can't do that. You know, it's interesting. Watch what happens when Daniel is consulted. Daniel's about to be slain uh, because he's just included as one among the group. And this is what God is doing. He's separating Daniel out as distinctly different from this occultic group. He's different. He worships a different God, and his God must be the true and living God. Verse 12 says, For this, this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should... Uh, should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to, to be slain. And Daniel answered and consulted with, and, uh, and Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the, ca the captain of the king's guard, which was well, gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And answered and said to, to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? And Arioch made known, uh, made the thing known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. And Daniel went to his house and made these things known unto Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and they would desire that they would desire mercies of, the, of God of heaven concerning this secret. And Daniel and his fellows should not, that, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. Now, you know what we see Daniel doing? Daniel says, oh, if everyone's going to be slain, I know who can give me this answer. Daniel had faith that his God was the true and living God, the God of heaven that can make known all secrets, even the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He goes and he makes, he goes and, and petitions God for that answer. You know these astrologers who believed in all these gods? They didn't ever believe in their own God, did they? They never even asked their God for any help. Daniel had faith in his God. And Daniel does his formula for success. I hate to say it that way, but it almost, I just want you to see it, make sure you get it. What does Daniel do? What he's always done. He goes to the king and he asks for time. Give me some time. Nothing needs to be hasty. Give me some time, and then I'm going to pray. And you know, with time and prayer, God gave the revelation to Daniel and revealed secrets that no one but the true God could ever know. And he's about to tell the king. And when Daniel found that out, it not only saved Daniel's life, but it saved all the wise men of Babylon, a picture of the nation of Israel being the salvation to the world. But, you know, I need to close here, and I need to close on this remark, that when Daniel's life was at risk, He's about to lose his neck. He knew who to go to for salvation. He went to the true God. None of this playing games with phony gods and church and religion. He went to the true God in faith and petitioned God for his life. And God saved him in a physical sense. But I'll tell you this. If you quit playing games with God and you mean business about your eternal soul 
and realize that you're a sinner and you have absolutely no right to ever dwell in the presence of a holy God. Through Jesus Christ, you can come to God in prayer, not by prayer, but through faith. Jesus Christ has done for you, and he can save you, and he will save you. When you truly believe that Jesus Christ was God who came and died for your sins at Calvary, shed his blood in full, complete payment of your sins, and he'll save all, God will save all who come unto him through Jesus Christ by way of faith. Believing the blood of Christ is the full payment of your sin. Everyone bow your head and close your eyes as we close. Daniel, when he realized he needed saved, he went to God and God saved him. God will do the same for you. But I'm not talking physical, I'm talking spiritual. I'm talking about saving your, your soul for, a des for eternal destiny. Saving you from the judgment of hell against you for your sins. Because when you believe in Jesus Christ, you're totally forgiven of all your sins. And God saves your soul, gives you everlasting life. Go to him and he'll save you. But don't play the foolish religious games. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you for the messages that we're learning here in Daniel that apply so, so clearly to our life and the whole study of Scripture and our approach to you. May we remember these things. May this Bible become more valuable to us. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. For it's the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.